Hello. You can hear me online. All right. Are you guys going to hover or are we going to? Okay. <laughs> For the camera? Yeah, we can all just get right up on the camera. Lens. Oh, that's the camera, not that one. All right. So, oh, ye few but faithful, we are going to talk. Wait, are you what We could, yeah, we don't. Yeah, just come on up when you have something to say. I mean, it's kind of, it's, we're kind of crowding the, um, it's, we could keep it pretty informal, huh? So, um, what do we want to talk about? Well, we wanted to go through some of the frameworks, ideas that we have for um, some ethical considerations around DHIS2 and specifically how we start to think about how DHIS2 uh, operates in um, from a perspective of do no harm um, and how that might be somewhat different than how we have historically perceived our work. So the goal of this session is not necessarily to give answers, but to just start a conversation, a very small conversation, mind you, <laughs> but still a conversation nonetheless, and something that we actually have internally. And to be honest, we actually probably did more work preparing for this presentation than we did for most of our other big presentations, because this one has a lot more to think about than just, here's the latest functionality, because that's what we do every day. This one's to us, at least me and Mike, probably far more interesting than... What's yeah, so David was David contributed, Marta contributed. So of all the presentations, I think in the conference, this one probably had the most contribution from from people of the sessions that I was involved with. Um, but again, it's a touchy subject, so I can see why people on a on a Thursday morning, so last day of the session, so I can see why. So um, yeah, what we want to do is think a little bit about some of the some of the sticking points. So what are the ethical obligations of his center at UIO? What are the ethical obligations of DHIS2 implementers, of system owners? What are some of the resources that we are using and you could use to think through everything and agreeing to the next steps? I'm wondering if the French translators are translating to no one. Oh, for the recording, it's good. Okay. Good point. All right. So why should we even care? So really, you know, DHIS2 is open source and open source in the most permissive way. You can use DHIS2 for anything and people do. Uh, and we're not really held liable to, for anything. Uh, of course, it would be bad press if we came out and found out that DHIS2 was being used to, to uh, monitor uh, oil wells in Saudi Arabia, which it is, but no one talks about that. Um, are you surprised, Anna, with the session you just came into? No, no, you meant to, you meant to come here. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you did not, not, not just a. Sorry, don't scare her away. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but why do we care, right? So none of us working on DHIS two are in this business to. We, we all want to make the world a better place. We're all kind of bleeding heart hippies in some form or fashion, right? Most of us coming from a public health humanitarian background aid workers. And we have to appreciate that what gets counted and how it gets counted and then how subsequently that data is represented is what becomes important to countries, right? Uh, and is acted upon, hopefully, if they're actually using their dashboards. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves um, how we build DHIS2 and implement DHIS2 Again, kind of in the context of being the world's largest health information system and now it's growing into climate and education, could potentially cause harm. It may already cause some harm. And there are things that uh, we might be doing or we might be promoting that facilitates that, promotes or uh, or uh, um, makes people feel that they could use it in a, in a less permissive way. Mike, you stood up. You have something to say? Well, I was just going to mention, so of course we do have some people online and we're recording. We do want this to just be a discussion. So if you have something you want to say, raise your hand, I'll come to you with a microphone so that we get it there. And I was going to mention myself during this part that you're explaining. It's obviously not the first time that we've thought or talked about it from the HISP Center perspective. And maybe it's helpful to at least add kind of 
some of the ways that we've thought about the ethical obligations of the HISP Center and the role that we have. Because as Scott mentioned, being open source and being just available online, most of the DHS2 implementations, we don't even know what they are. They don't contact us. We have no monitoring of their systems. I mean, that's part of our, our ethical stance as well, is that we're doing a free open source platform. But we do have multiple areas where we we interact with the world from DHS2. One is what we build in the first place. Another is the HISP network and community that we are responsible for. And another is the kind of guidance and recommendations that we put out into the world. So those are kind of the key touch points that we have with what, what is our responsibility and what are the things that we're putting out there. And so that's that's kind of the perspective that we're going to talk things through um, in this session. And we really want your feedback, and we're hoping for this to be a topic that continues after this session, but that we start to have more of an engagement with the community of practice and that this actually leads to uh, some actions on our part to be more clear about what uh, ethical framework we're using and what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, very, very succinctly. So that kind of brings us to a classical problem. If you if take us back to Ethics 101, the trolley problem, right? So you're, uh, you're the trolley operator. or So you're this guy right here operating. The trolley's out of control coming in you got to make a choice. Do you pull the lever to send the trolley over here to kill one person or pull the lever over here to kill multiple people and save four? Or do you just don't do anything and let the trolley just run over four people? Right? What is your obligation? Well, in DHIS2 world, not that we've ever been in this particular situation, um, we we typically have taken somewhat of a more of a public health view on this and we have done a lot of our work i think over the years wrote a paper about it uh that that we try to maximize the good for as many people and that we are trying and we are constantly updating and changing the ways that we produ produce, what we produce in DHIS2, what DHIS2 actually does, and what uh, and our guidance on how DHIS2 should be implemented, so that it is beneficial to the most people as we perceive it, right? And this is a very in ethical world. The world of ethics is a very kind of consequentialist, utilitarian view of it, but it is not necessarily do no harm. We're not trying to minimize harm. We're trying to maximize good, right? And I think there's a really there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a big distinction there. And so, in the latest uh, digital development principles, principles for digital development, principles for digital development, I had the words but not the order. Um, they stress anticipate and mitigate harm as a principle, not maximize good. So if this is the standard that we're being held to, what are we doing? And I would say that our general worldview and practice has been not this. It's been maximizing good, not minimizing harm. So we kind of have to go back to the question is, well, if we do something and we know that it will probably cause 10 people to die, but 100 people will live or be better off for it, what do we do? Historically, we would say, okay, well, 90 people with better lives is better. So we'll do that. Not that we've ever had to make these life or death choices necessarily with the software, but just to kind of be a bit hyperbolic with it. But we have lots of questions, right? So when we say we're maximizing the good, who are we maximizing the good for? Who decides what is good? And what is everyone's role in that decision-making process? Who is the authority figure? Is it me and Mike deciding what goes into the software? Is it Anna working with the donors who uh, translate what they perceive good is into our implementation and guidance and ultimately the roadmap? Is it the researchers who are giving us broader perspectives and informing us kind of from an informatics perspective? Is it Phil? <laughs> so we have to, there's a lot of, there's a lot of perspectives and I don't think that many of these are actually would necessarily agree. Or is it, of course, the ministries? We say we work for the ministries, right? Are the ministries telling us what good? 
I think that, you know, a lot of ministries have very different opinions about what they perceive good to be. Uh, some ministries would have opinions that are probably somewhat anathema to our opinions about what good is, uh, or the opposite. So who is, who's making the rules? And of course, there's all these international guidelines, human, uh, human rights guidelines. Um, not to gloss over that, that last part too much is to say that we, of course, are in Europe. We're in the Oslo University. Uh, we uh, are underneath the European Conventions on Human Rights. Norway is a big supporter of UN and the principles uh, and Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But the question is, I mean, how much as this project do we have a responsibility to promote those values versus other kinds of agreements and dimensions on human rights? I mean, one of them we listed here is the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. They had an agreement that was from 1983 or something. Um, that's just one example. There's many. And again, what 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 role do we have being placed where we are, funded how we are, but working with the countries that we do, what what kind of framework should we be promoting? How do we consider where that overlaps with the mission of DHS2 versus things that maybe are generally agreed on by the people here, but are not the core mission? What are the things that we should be promoting? So there's quite a lot to unpack there and, and think about what our responsibility is working with the globe, not just working within a European context. Yeah. So just to put it, so we've been talking about more of abstract um, perspective on here, just to put it into some like, you know, actually real ethical considerations that we have to make. And I tried to kind of frame this in this good versus do no harm conversation. So something that would be good for most, but not for all, right? Broadly considered good for most, but not for all. For example, biometrics and AI. Biometrics could solve a lot of these patient identi identity problems that we're having. But there are plenty of people that say biometrics is the first step to, you know, profiling. We know that there are biometrics technology that can identify with a relatively high degree of accuracy uh, um, uh, based upon or identify someone's sexual orientation. Right. So which biometrics do we want to facilitate this? Do we even have any control over it? It's already happening. Right. Um, biometrics could be used and has historically been used. <laughs> you can think about like the Rwanda genocide, for example, for lots of nefarious <laughs> things, you know, profiling, uh, identifying sexual orientation, uh, maybe possibly religions, gender identification, these kind of things. Um, yeah, yeah, please. You guys speak in the mic. Yeah. Um... So just generally, um, around these kind of things, what we're what we're trying to get across is that um, things like biometrics, AI, um, they they have these implications, and the harm is kind of inevitable. This it's sort of um, there there nothing is completely without causing harm. Everything kind of divides divides things into different pieces, divides society into different pieces and um, favors some people and kind of causes, uh, can have these side effects for other people. Um, so it's um, with like biometrics, it draws attention to certain certain things um, and it can highlight, uh, it can highlight various different kinds of people. Um, so what we're trying to get, what we're trying to do here is to start a discussion about the fact that the harm is kind of inherent in in what's in, in what's happening, um, and find find a way to be able to talk about that. Yeah, no, thanks, Catherine. Um, well, maybe I would just say briefly as the tracker product manager, the part of DHS two that collects individual level data and that is used to actually register individuals. This, these are not just academic or theoretical kinds of questions. These are real questions. The biometric question is one that we have struggled with for about seven years. We have been approached many times by different biometric vendors to include extension points or to embed biometrics. It's a public health question for sure, because you can't have a good longitudinal health record if you don't know who the person is. And that's one of the key challenges in the countries where we work. 
it's an ethical question because the people that have national IDs in the countries where we work are those that are more connected and that are part of the wealthier class and the groups we're trying to reach are the most vulnerable that are least likely to be registered as a national ID. And so providing them an ability to have an identification and receive health services is also an ethical question. So it's there's quite a lot, again, to, to think through here and decide what our stances are. And so far, for example, on biometrics, we've kind of punted. I mean, we just kicked it down the field. We actually haven't made a decision. We've argued about it for years. And meanwhile, it's an open source software. And so biometric companies are using it and creating extension points as being applied in Bangladesh. It's being applied in Ghana. And we haven't ever made a statement on it because it's been a difficult question. So that's part of why we want to be opening the conversation here is so that we can do a better job of having a framework and a set of principles that help us to address these questions and think them through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, yeah. Uh, Got to be careful with the chairs. <laughs> yeah, just very briefly to add, the, hi, I'm Silvia, by the way. Um, very briefly to add on the, on the same topic as uh, someone, I come more from the world of uh, Acad uh, academia researching unfair forms of digital identity. So I kind of uh, very two cents uh, here, I think is especially important in the light of the responsibility that um, Scott, Catherine and uh, Mike mentioned of the HIS2, not only to identify ways in things in ways in which things can go wrong. So like uh, Scott mentioned, the forms of exclusion and also profiling that can be associated to, to biometrics, but also to build alternatives to them. So research really shows, uh, and hopefully there will be some time today to briefly mention some research advances in this respect. Uh, research really shows alternatives and ways to, for example, by involving civil society, by involving those affected by unfair forms of identification research increasingly shows forms of uh, uh, what personally in my work I call fair ID as opposed to unfair forms of identification. So given the responsibility of the HIS2 in this place, perhaps this session can really be a site to unpack and discuss forms of fair identification because uh, Finally, research is starting to build uh, like uh, clear advances in this uh, respect. Great. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to stop talking at you in a second, and then we're going to do a minty. We're going to ask all of your opinions on this. It'll be anonymous, of course, but uh, but just to run through a couple more examples. Um, good for a few important people, but not for most people. Important in quotes here. Passive. I've been asked like five times in the course of this conference already for passive workforce surveillance. We want to know how people are clicking in DHIS2, right? Who does that benefit? That benefits the sys admins? I don't know. Uh, but does it does it affect, does it improve the people who are actually the end users of DHIS2? Maybe, could probably harm them as well. Does it, does it improve the the, the benefactors of hopefully the platform, which is you know the public health outcomes, that's really hard to say. So um, good for them, but not for us. And I say us as being like UIO his center. So this is uh, lots of countries and people have thought about using DHIS2 for, I won't name names, but potentially like ethic identifying um, individuals along ethnic lines, sexual orientation, religious um, affiliations. Uh, we know, of course, there are plenty of DHIS2 countries that are more uh, falling under the authoritarian regime style of government. Uh, there are oil companies using DHIS2. There are uh, prisons have been interested in using DHIS2. Lots of militaries have been interested in using DHIS2. Not necessarily folks that you see walking around at this conference, I think that we have a little bit of a culture about this conference that means that these folks don't come, but they're still there. And there's companies that provide DHIS2 as a service for, say, oil companies. That exists. So, in fact, they're quite active on the community practice. Um, so, not exactly who we would think to uh, traditionally affiliate with, but then we have to ask some questions. 
you know, we're donor or funded and the donor money is getting harder and harder to get. What if they pay us a bunch? Can we can we take from the bad and give to the good? Kind of or do we even have a choice? Like again, completely open source. They can do whatever they want and should we even care? Another example is uh bad for bad for uh, oh sorry, good for us but bad for most. <laughs> and this one is a little bit controversial maybe. Security and specifically like two factor authentication. Like so we are putting a lot of effort into making DHIS2 as secure as, as as we as we possibly can. But countries are constantly asking us, how do we give access to data entry or to analytics without logging credentials? <laughs> right? They want it to be as way more open. Uh, most of the apps that we're getting, a lot of the apps, not most, but a lot of the apps that we get submitted to the App Hub, we do a security review for them, and we see that they've they've embedded login credentials into their open source code. <laughs> right? Like. These are like, from a security perspective, 100% bad. Uh, but this is what they're doing because they just want to, because the logins and all of that stuff is is, is is preventing their end users from being accessed to DHIS2 or their decision makers from accessing their analytics. Um, and so they're asking us to make DHIS2 more open at the, at the cost of uh, basic security parameters. Mike, anything to say on that one? I mean, just to say, I, there, there's, again, a, an ethical consideration on the other side of this. I mean, part of our mission actually is data use and oh. trying to have data-driven decision-making. And getting data to the people that make decisions is one of our biggest challenges. And so if on one set of ethical considerations, you're locking things down as much as you can, and on the other side of it, you're trying to get it to the right people and make sure that they use it, uh, those things don't, they, they, they're at counter purposes at times. So we really do have to think them through and decide every step of this. Is this going to make it less likely for them to have an evidence-based decision? So let's just go through this, make it our last slide so we can jump to the Minty. Yeah, this I'll just do really quickly to say, of course, we're not just making this up in a vacuum. There's many different people that have written about the very same things. We have the principles for digital development, which Scott mentioned, which is, again, this update that came out recently that wants us to anticipate harm and mitigate harm. So that's an interesting perspective for us to try to do more with. There are some open source licenses that specifically are trying to address these concerns. There's the do no harm license or the Hippocratic license. One of the interesting aspect of like the Hippocratic license is that you create the license by clicking on the things that you want to specifically exclude. So you could put in there like, this will not be used for any petroleum based industry, or this will never be used to register someone's religious identity. And then you generate the license. And so it's, it's a bit of a pick and choose your ethics uh, to generate a license that then is, is valuable for others. And of course, there are many in the humanitarian or innovation space that have published their own stance on the ethical principles. There are some organizations, for example, that are very against the use of registration of individuals, and particularly when you get to biometrics. Um, and these are large organizations like Oxfam or MSF that have very strong stances about refugees and which ones can be included in your health service and which not, et cetera. So again, it's not that there's a common answer here. Lots of smart people have thought it through and they are coming from a very good place and they've published their stance. And I think we have a onus to understand what their stances are and make some decisions ourselves about what the what the principles that we adhere to are. Um, so we, yeah, so we've talked about a lot of different kind of broad perspectives of harm. I think we have to kind of be a, a pretty mindful that there's, there's a big difference between intentional harm and unintentional harm, right? right? So intentional harm being like, I actively want to go and use DHIS2 to, to potentially degrade, de you know, degradate someone's life or inflict some kind of, uh, problem upon them. And then I think the vast majority of of harm that may be coming from DHIS2 or just this industry in general is mostly usually unintentional, right? So it's, you know, people not uh, collecting more data than they really need, and then that data potentially being go falling into the wrong hands uh, in uh, or um, being shared publicly or something like that. And so there's like this severity risk matrix uh, that, that, uh, that could possibly help guide some of our decisions. Um, Let's, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sunday, 
<laughs> just wanted to chime in a little bit on that. Um, that um, what we're what we're trying to do with all these things with um, kind of showing this intentional and intentional harm, showing all these different frameworks that people have been talking about. Um, we're trying to open up is a conversation that s starts talking about how there is intentional harm and how there is un I don't want to say there's how there is intentional harm. Um, what I mean is that there's potential for uh, for harm to be taking place um, intentionally or unintentionally. And uh, because there's this potential for there's this this potential risk of of these things taking place, um, we want to be able to start finding ways of talking about that. Um, like in the in the last slide, we have uh, some different frameworks that other people are using to talk about these kind of things and to start conversations because they're really difficult conversations to have. It's it's difficult to start approaching the possibility that what um, what DHS two is is trying to achieve. You know. Um, Scott was saying at the beginning that fundamentally we're all well-meaning hippies, you know, um, and trying to sort of start a conversation where we we know that we all want to do good, but that there's these potential side effects, there's these potential unintentional harms that that can take place. How do you start talking about that? It's really difficult. It's really difficult to start like a dialogue that talks a bit more openly about like how do you handle the fact that there are possible issues it's an open source platform there's like it's um there's certain aspects of that that can be controlled and certain ones that can't be controlled like um so with this entire session we're just trying to start a conversation about uh like how how do we work with that how do we deal with with these possible side effects that 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 could be happening you know? so to get the conversation started let's get your opinions on everything that we just talked about so we are going to do a minty those online now we have quite a few people online actually 16 people online uh so everyone if you could get your phones out um get connected to the internet give you just a minute to do this um take it take a grab the um thing and then you know we can do this too uio folks this is one minty we can participate in i'm just gonna grab it myself So the first question, is everybody on? We have only three people. So it's, uh, yeah, it's minty.com and then there's a code. Yeah. We got the contrarian. Yeah, we won't. We won't ask for opinions. We have. Uh, it's going to. This is the most benign of the slides. This. This is going to get spicy. This we're we're obviously a biased group that yeah. accepted showing up at eight thirty in the morning <laughs> yeah. to talk about ethics. So we'll take that into consideration as well. Uh, I'll give just thirty more seconds before we go on. Yeah, twelve. Still. Okay. Yeah, we're really, really preaching to the choir here. All right, it'll get probably a little bit more spread out as we go. All right, ready? Oh, one more. Okay. Yeah. All right. Second question: His DHIS two should focus on helping the most people, even if it harms a few. So you have totally, sorry, I didn't go through the answers. Totally disagree, somewhat disagree, neutral, somewhat agree, and totally agree. Yeah. We even lost a few people in the quiz, so. 
<laughs> if that scared you away, oh, man. All right. Everybody voted. Who wants to vote? Of course, you don't have to vote. But it is anonymous, so we have no idea who you are. All right. Interesting spread there. More somewhat disagree. So we have more of the folks who would, uh, more of the, um, yeah, Mike, you. Oh, that's the 8.30 a.m. crowd for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. we, we could argue over the semantics of every, every word, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, but I mean, there have been moments where they say, for example, like, um, let's go in and build an uh, antenatal care tracker, for example. But in this particular context, um, women can only be married who come in to the clinic to receive an antenatal care. So we want it hard coded that a woman can't be unwed. So we're like, OK, well, it's going to help most women because they are married. But of course, there are going to be plenty of folks who are not married and also pregnant. But in this context, that doesn't happen. We don't accept it. Yeah. <laughs> like with this question is that it's super binary, right? It's like helping or it's like life or that, right? Yeah. So but we're kind of framing this ethical question as are we going to have people live or people die? But the reality is, I think, in my opinion, yeah, should be framed more like can we help everyone to live a bit better mm. rather than helping only few or most to live more or extremely better? So I think like if we frame the, dis the discussion a bit differently, like just the example you gave, just mm. illustrate this, what we want to remove barriers to everyone. Uh, even if it's not perfect and it will not help a lot, only those married, right? Mm. So I think we can also frame these ethical questions a bit differently. Yeah, I, I, we, I think we wrote these questions in the most provocative binary way we could. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But no, you're absolutely right. It, it's, it's very complex and there's a huge scale to all of this. Um, yeah. Oh, Phil, do you want to go back to this question? Yeah, no, just, uh, just a comment on your um, example. I mean that that's an example where, to to my mind, there's not sort of inherent harm in yeah. that choice, right? There's well, except that pregnant pregnant non married women can't receive care. Yeah, but they if they don't already, you're not increasing the harm. Or you know, so the, these these uh, each case is very difficult, right? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean that's a that's a good well, question. And, and for that specific one, oh, okay. just to also say. Um, the the women in this specific culture already are aware of this and yeah. know how to navigate it. So it was actually potentially good for them that it's not registering them as a single pregnant woman because then they can be identified as being outside of the norm. So yeah. they can come in and get services and be claimed as wed and then they're safer for it. So again, it's very contextually important. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we wrote these to be a bit provocative, so we're glad for the discussion. Okay, let we let's. I, I know it's fun. Uh, we let's just get through it because it's going to get worse. So, <laughs> all right. So uh, hopefully, hopefully your mint your minty's updated. Yeah. Okay. So uh, DHIS two should focus on helping the most people. Oh, did we just do this one? Nah. Okay. Oh, it's a repeat question. Okay. Well, maybe you change your mind, so go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. We'll skip. Um, yeah. So DHIS2 should focus on minimizing harm, even if it means if, if fewer people are helped. I think we had about 14 was our max. It's 15. Better. That's getting better. Getting more participants. Hell of a time to join. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. We can we can talk, but we do have we do have a lot of these. So oh fantastic. So. Um yeah. Uh I think my thought provocation is I struggle to imagine 
a scenario like that, a scenario in which minimizing harm would result uh, in fewer being helped. Uh, well, like not implementing biometrics. Sorry? Not implementing biometrics. And fewer will be helped. Uh, are we sure, sure? 100% sure. It's just second thought provocation here. Like, um, uh, so I worked mainly not so much with health, but mostly with food security in Southern India. So where like we used to have, we still have a food distribution system uh, that ran very much on a paper-based way for many years. And it did have problems, but um, uh, of all sorts really. But since computerization first and biometrization next, uh, like the numbers, like, and this is not my research, this is econometric research, like exclusions in basic delivery of food supplies spiked for all sorts of issues. So I don't think the system became better off with biometrics. Quite the contrary. I think maybe that case, but I think they're... Okay. In the... <laughs> maybe, Mike, you can respond. Again, I, if there were a clear answer, I don't think it would be this hard for us to, <laughs> to discuss. Yeah. No. I think for, yeah, okay. All right. I'll pop in two cents about the idea of, um, of harm. And it kind of picks up on what you were saying, that um, there's a lot of different ways of kind of thinking about what, what harm is. Um, and particular way that kind of appeals to me is um the idea that you can there's a potential to 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 make life better for somebody but that potential doesn't actually take place so you know if you can sure you were saying that like um if maybe i'm mis mishearing what you, what you said so just kind of contradict me if if that's the case um but if there's if if you're able to improve somebody's life uh but then that doesn't happen um, and then you don't take that action, then that is that can also be seen as a form of harm. Um, if you say yeah. that like there's there's like a hundred people and um, ninety people's lives are improved, but by improving those ninety people's lives, it's not that those ten people's lives, those other ten, that their lives are the same, because they could have their lives could have been improved. So actually, mm -hmm. their lives are worse off. That's a different way of looking at looking at what harm could be could be seen as, you know. Yeah. So, um, like, I mean, the kind of communities that are, that I work with, it's very much like ten percent of the of, of the population, and by be by not being included within or by being very much included within biometrics. I mean, I work with with um, with the LGBTQ plus communities, and by very much being kind of potentially recognized within data. That makes that community's life more difficult, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, there's there's a lot of different perspectives on. It. And as Mike was saying, you know, these these aren't easy answers. These aren't e even easy questions to ask, you know. Yeah. Um, so let's see where we go next. Yeah. It's okay. His view IO should have an ethical framework to evaluate all feature development and implementation support. As Mike pointed out, there are a number of ethical frameworks that exist already, uh, and the digital principles for development are kind of nudging uh, products like DHIS2 in that direction. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, come on. It's a discussion. Because we're addressing the issue of uh, frameworks, and you mentioned a lot the human rights, the digital principles. But I think what's interesting with uh, DHIS2 is that of course, I mean, you're just building the code, right? In a sense. Um, well, but in reality, you're kind of uh, providing the tool or you're funneling the production of official statistics uh, in health education now. Uh, and so just because of that, I think it becomes a like, huge responsibility also because you're enabling governments to produce their own national official statistics. And so I would like to suggest that you take a look also at the UN principles for official statistics. No, uh, it's called yeah, fundamental principles for official statistics. And, and it can give, gives a great framework to kind of think of course, not so much about the code and your own responsibility, but like what will that, that, that be used for? Mm. And in education, we see a lot of, um, I mean, we work for governments. So of course we, we're listening to their requests and we're trying to 
um, just as you mentioned a bit earlier, but sometimes, of course, governments turn against their own populations. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make sure that we don't enable them to use the data produced to uh, identify or uh, breach confidentiality or security or uh, privacy. And so um, getting perhaps more into the area of official statistics uh, could be uh, interesting for, for you all to, to have some more reflection beyond the philosophical issues of it. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, thank you for that. On our hands. Um, hi, so this isn't my field at all, so I'm sort of more interested in hearing like the researchers in this field and, the, and your reflections on this, but where do you draw the line? I mean, you can um, make a hammer, which is a useful tool, but you could also kill your neighbor with it, right? So should you not make hammers or should you, like, because I think building the DHS2 software, it's like a fluid, what is controversial and what is uncontroversial, so you can you can have the possibilities of creating different option sets to choose from in the drop-down list, which is a very neutral functionality and a good thing. But then you could, of course, have horrendous options and use that data for something bad. So I think that's like one side of discussing ethics. And the other one is what kind of implementation work do we take part in and what kind of advice do we give? I don't know if that made sense. But you, I would like to hear your reflections. I guess it's a pretty good I mean, I would say one thing, and then any of you that want to respond. But the it's interesting because I, there there aren't a lot of ethical conversations around Excel. Yeah. Right? yeah. But Excel is used by drug cartels and the mafia and anybody that wants to do anything negative. But it's they're just making a tool and it's out there. But we are in a very different space. So to your point about we we just make the software, not really, look at us. We're here together. We're also a community. We're also uh, engendering norms. I mean, we're, we're, we're having an impact in a normative kind of way, and we need to be very careful about that, and we need to think that through. The question of technology at this intersection, I mean, it comes from the very beginning. The, the Alan Turing with the Enigma machine, the first thing that they did was say, wait, we can't use this all the time to save every ship breaking the Germans code, because if we do, they'll know that we broke the code and they'll switch it up. So, I mean, these, these are questions that have been with us all along and that we really should be thinking through. Yeah. Fun. All right. Another. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, I mean, that, that gets to the heart of the, of the question. Like what, how do you actually practically deal with these things you know and um like i mean i like i do research so uh my <laughs> my my answer is very 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 comfortably to i mean i've had I've, I've, uh, um to those kinds of questions i say the mo like the most important thing is to have conversations like um um like to find at least some kind of agreement for how to get through like the 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 difficult gray cases. I mean, there there are certainly cases where it's fairly black and white. Like there's there's like things that are obviously can't happen and things obviously can happen, but a huge bulk of the of the kinds of problems and the ones that we're sort of going to start to be asking in the later questions, particularly around how do you handle the stuff in between. Um, and my own perspective on it is, um. For starters, listening, talking, having open conversations about the fact that those issues exist. I think, that, I think that's maybe a first way into it. Um, like finding out how other people have kind of worked with, what kind of frameworks are out there, what sort of conversations other people have had. And building like building like an, an organizational culture that lets you be able to talk about these things. Because they're bloody difficult things to talk about. You know, these are these are difficult conversations. These are difficult questions. Even the kind of the first couple of questions we were they're fairly divisive. You know, um, so uh, yeah, I think the, the at least the like the way to the way to start getting through it is to to kind of um, build a culture within within organizations to be able to say, look, I mean, there there are potentially problems here. How do we talk about this stuff? What frameworks have how have other people started to approach these kinds of things? Um, not immediately trying to jump to jump to solutions because the solutions 
like the questions are, I don't know, kind of treated in an agile way, you know, like um, that you you kind of move a little bit forward, have more conversations, have your you know morning scrum session. Um, and then you go to the next thing and you go, right, how do we work through the next problem? How do we work through these things? Because it, it takes time to change these things. And yeah, that's I think that's certainly the way that I'd I'd advise to start approaching the stuff, yeah. not kind of thinking what's the what's the solution in the end. We need to keep going now. So that's the so add on top of what Catherine uh, just said. I think one uh, I I mentioned it before, but I think uh, like uh, putting this in the DHIS two example, uh, uh, talking to and with the civil society is paramount. I been around these days, but I didn't see many civil society representatives, perhaps because this is not necessarily the the case in which we, we meet them. But I know, for example, uh, uh, I'm speaking mainly about the Indian context. There is, uh, because that's where I do most of my research. For example, there, there is plenty of opportunities to engage civil society, to engage, uh, for example, organizations that work with victims of biometric exclusion, uh, there's plenty of uh, of occasions of interaction. And if I can be entirely outspoken here in the session, I'd welcome a lot more of such interaction. And instead of like uh, sitting behind my academic desk and say, oh, interaction is beautiful. I'm actually very help, uh, happy, again, speaking about the Indian context, but not only that, for example, there's large organizations, Access Now, Privacy International, uh, uh, who are extremely active in the international space on these things. Uh, uh, so this is an open invitation. I have um, uh, uh, actually quite close connections with both, and it will be fantastic to, uh, perhaps there is already a dialogue and I'm not aware of it, uh, but if we want to maximize that dialogue, I'm very happy to facilitate it. Yep. So did we answer this one already? They're kind of similar. No. no. Ethical review board. Yeah. So should UIO DHIS2 have a ethical review board? No, not the academic not an academic review board that exists to just have it. That's the question. We don't have anything. No, I mean, it, the, the way that we were thinking of this is that it's a bit of an external group, yeah. right? So it's not just us internally talking to each other with an echo chamber and thinking, yeah, everything's fine. Should we be uh, responsible to outside external review ethically and those and the review board would be responsible probably hypothetically for making those like ethical guidelines and frameworks that we talked about in the previous questions no uh, yeah, but just, uh, that's okay for the people online question. Do, do you have at his maybe a, like a team actually that uh, that works on ethics like either like focused on research or uh, a team working on the development side like is there anyone like on a daily basis no we we have a group of enthusiasts but yeah not... i mean of course the university has their own boards we also of course there are research boards there are these but there isn't a dedicated group about the hisp center that is tackling ethics so ethics are in the hallways ethics are the enthusiasts and we have all of these other you know donor rules and things that we adhere to but there's not that body I think like boards and like committees are good, but they're like working very sporadically on issues and so mm. they don't have a big picture and sometimes they're not even data experts or like health experts. Yeah. Like patients. So, um, so I think, yeah, I, I, I mean, thinking about these issues is like really a thing that we should formalize, I guess, in all our institutions. Should we uh, keep on keeping on? Because we, we do have a few more of these for sure. All right. So obviously a huge component of what we do is our trainings and academies. You know, we've trained thousands of people around the world now. Uh, should we incorporate any kind of ethical considerations into what we're actually training people to do? Because we're really not. I mean, most of the time we're we're just training them on how to configure DHIS2 and they can configure, once they know how to configure it, they can configure it for anything to, to honest point earlier. An interesting rebuttal to this would be there have certainly been countries that have told us that uh, don't don't come in with your uh, your opinions because that's modern colonialism, digital colonialism, neocolonialism. 
That's right. And again, I think it's a lot easier said than done because yeah. of whose ethics? Should yeah, be. exactly. Yeah. Can I just uh, say that then, uh, perhaps this, is, in my personal view, this is one of the least controversial that we've seen so far. I have more a question as to how. I think it depends on who's receiving the training, whether it's controversial or not. Yeah. Oh. But that's the other thing. I think, I, I mean, uh, it's more like how to do so, because I have a hard time seeing the counter argument, but it's more like how to do so, avoiding to superimpose principles instead of uh, like arriving together at an understanding of what is ethical in a certain context. Uh, for example, there are, there are folks here who are representing branches of governments of more kind of uh, of governments that have less of a track record with human rights than other countries. And they're using DHIs too. Should we say, nope, if you're using DHIs too for this, don't come to the academies. We won't train you. Okay. That's clear. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Just as a super. All right. Let's go. Ethical aspects do no harm should be incorporated into the HISP MOU. So the MOU is the, if you're not familiar, is what uh, is our formalized relationship between our implementing partners, the HISP organizations around the world, and University of Oslo HISP Center. So it has currently no considerations of do no harm or ethics in it. Uh, it has considerations of sharing innovation and sharing knowledge, but that's very, very broad and not specific to anything. Yeah, so the question was, if we can repeat the do no harm principle, what it is. So, I mean, you can uh, Google it. I mean, so essentially, it's very, very vague. So it's anticipate and minimize the potential for your product to, to be used to cause harm. But in your train example, letting the train... Um, yeah. Yeah. Is the do no harm principle to divert the train? It, it you're going to kill someone. So you could say the train is out of control. It's going to kill four people if you do nothing. Because then it goes back. But to if the... you do something, then you're causing it to kill one person. Yeah. Because then it goes back to the the questions again of um, I'm just being difficult. Yes. Uh, of should you help 95 percent of the population to receive the good health services versus but harming, I mean, to Catherine's arguments, like leaving someone out and thereby harming them, is that violating the do no harm? It's, I'm just I'm trying to understand what the principle means. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Mike. You... Um, yes, yeah, if I can tie it back a little bit to that, that trolley problem, the do no harm, like, um, there so with the with the with the, this train this trolley problem there's like five people on the track and um they're gonna die but if you flick the switch then you are implicate you're you know killing one person but you're causing that one person to die um saving five yeah. sorry saving five saving killing five, one but, but saving five but, but equally i mean like when, when yeah. like there are there's lots of different perspectives on that yeah, neither yeah. of them are do no harm that's kind of the problem and that's sort of the reality of, I mean, that's not the reality in of itself, but like, that's the reality of like what, what goes on in the real world with like, with his, with DHS2, with, with any of these things. There, there is no simple delineation between this causes harm and this does no harm. Um, I'd venture to say that it's pretty much impossible to do no harm. It is something to aim for though. Um, and like neither of those decisions with the with the trolley problem do no harm, you know. And I again, I, yeah, I don't think there is a, a great answer. It depends on who you ask. The do no harm open source license defines it this way: it allows free use of the software except by organizations, projects, or products that promote, lobby for, or derive a majority of income from abuses of human rights environmental destruction, conflict and war, and addictive or destructive products and services. Yeah, it was about uh, they promote, lobby for, or derive a majority of income from any of these things. 
Yeah. Maybe just referring because government profiting will not generate income necessarily, but just like yeah. Uh, we, we, we yeah, yeah. Again, very difficult. I've I've had a stance for a long time that we, the HISP Center, should not work actively with any military. That's not necessarily accepted across the group, and not everybody agrees with me. And it's something that, like, again, we don't have a framework to say yes or no for. Um, and in many places, the military are providing a ton of health services. And so why aren't we working with them? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. All right. His should change the speaking of which his should change the license of DHIS two to enforce do no harm or Hippocratic oath. Great segue. We've lost a lot of participants. Just, you might just refresh. Did you, re can you refresh your page? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry, it might be a little bit slow for all on the. A more different spread here. Could also say that we uh, change our license to uh, get more money out of people so that we can do more good. Maybe. Who just depends on who's who we're getting the money from. Yeah, true. All right. For, Phil for, has a couple of comments. For example, we had a partnership previously with a pharmaceutical company, and there are people that would say we shouldn't work with pharmaceutical companies. And then the question is, well, I mean what if they pay us? Yeah. And if we're diverting money into something that's very good and they exist anyway, I don't know. There's lots of ways to think about that. And they did pay us. And visiting a pharmaceutical company, corporate office, was probably the highlight of my career. I'm just hearing a lot where we talk about we either do good yeah. or we do harm. But it's, I mean, it's not that simple, is it? You, you know, you can do good without doing harm. You can do harm without doing, you know, then they're, they're not sort of mutually exclusive in in this way. Yeah. Uh, and And I think, you know, yeah. So I just want to address that, you know, because I, I think the way we've talked about it is we're, we're talking about if we do this, then we imply if we do good, we imply harm. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I think you can still minimize harm while doing good, of course. And that's what. Yeah, we're putting it in very binary, stark terms just for the sake of of discussion. But, but yeah, but also, I do think we have a little bit more of an onus to think about it that way, because at least in my opinion, part of our mission is vulnerable populations in particular. And if we, they're the ones that it's very easy to brush off in many other instances and say, yeah, it's fine. This doesn't affect them. What we're doing is for the majority of people, but we're actually not focused just on the majority of people. We are focused on vulnerable populations. That's what public health is about. And so it, it makes us have to think an extra step and say, okay, what's really going to happen with this? For example, there are countries where DHIS2 is used by civil society NGOs to monitor key populations, men who have sex with men, intravenous drug users. At the same time, the Ministry of Health is running DHIS2 as their national HMIS, and the two are trying to keep the, the NGOs are trying to keep the data from the Ministry of Health. Right? But they're both DHIS2 users. Right? Yeah. Okay. I know. It's fun. Um, okay. HISP, HISP, uh, HISP UIO, HISP, uh, the, the community, should hold groups they support to international human rights standards, even if that means not supporting the use of DHIS2 in some countries. Whew. And just remember to refresh your page if you're uh, not seeing the question come up. Well, so for uh, example, we have projects that are lined up to go to some countries that are probably, yeah, I'm trying to find, you know, less centered on what like European like commission on human rights, right? 
Yeah. I'm trying to. Yeah, coffee. Oh, sorry. I come to you with a microphone just for people online. There are places that we can go that donors can't even go um, that we work in. Um, I think we should come back to what Katrin was just saying about the fact that what is important is to have the conversation. While we'll be defaulting, will be to uh, go blind-minded when we discuss these things or when we implement. As Anne was saying, uh, you can use your, your knife to make a good barbecue, but you can also use it to kill somebody. So the, what is important is to have the conversation, but we don't have the role to hold the organizations accountable. This is going beyond our role, and this is complexifying our work. I think we might be uh, emotionally intelligent when we approach these very sensitive questions. So what we are required to is to have the conversation, to be open, uh, open and discuss with them, oh, look, this DHS is very powerful. You can use it for X, Y, Z, but you also use it to have abuses. And we don't, uh, we think that we should think about it and so on. And also be mindful of what you, somebody was saying that um, uh, views, world views might be different from places to places. Yeah. And when we are going, we need to apply some humility when we are trying to discuss these issues. Of it. Well, maybe exactly. And well, well, one example of this is there have been HISP uh, employees who have set up DHIS2 to, to count votes in very undemocratic elections, right? And those votes have, and that and that DHIS2 instance was used by the political party to justify their very undemocratic uh, victory. Um, that was a HISP employees who knew how to use DHIS2. Should they have done that? <laughs> I just had this conversation yesterday. <laughs> well, it wasn't you, Coffee, by the way, I'd say. Oh, you know, uh, yeah. we, we recently underwent uh, a series of elections. And one funny thing that happened a couple of weeks ago was that the uh, the parliament uh, mandate, was the term was over in December. So they prolonged their term and then they voted a new constitution. A new constitution, which text has never been published, nobody has ever seen it. And uh, the president took a decree to uh, publish the uh, the the constitution without publishing the text. Okay. And then uh, suddenly, uh, a couple uh, yesterday, I had a discussion with somebody from the office of the prime prime minister. I used to be working with them, and then they were like, "Hey." You know, DHS2 is doing a lot of things in Togo. Can we use that for the elections? I say, ah, that's a great question. So maybe I will drag you and then we'll go back to the discussion because this is something very critical. Um, I, I'm asking myself, if he was serious, how I, I can I can respond to that kind of request? And uh, I have no idea. <laughs> and that's tough. So, Would you have a DHS2? No, no shirt. Okay. I think this is an interesting case because if they were not to use DHS DHS two, they would use Excel, something like that. Sure. But in Excel, you don't have I don't believe I can't remember, but you don't have this tick box where you say, I agree to not use this for wrongful purposes. Yeah, yeah. So basically what I understand is that you could have said, Hey, you're using it for wrongful purposes. So yeah. we're calling off the election, basically. Um, because I mean if if you see, I mean, if you have this this agreement yeah. uh, in the term of use then it means that you can flag when it's not properly used. I Potentially, guess. yeah. And I think that the sticking point there was, of course, anyone can go to DHIS2 for it, but that it was a HISP person who did it. I, I do think it was a very important point about the role because I, I think that we as people have, of course, our own ethical interests and, and standards, but time is session, when we're being funded to do a certain thing and we have what? a mission and is it in our mission or role? Is it, I mean, is that ethically right for us to parachute into someplace and try to enforce a norm? We're not being selected or paid to do that. And to further complicate things, uh, we really want to work on capacity building of local staff. So 
we might say, okay, in this country, we will we'll support um, disease surveillance. It's pretty uncontroversial that we should track cases of Ebola, but we know that the government also do not respect um, uh, the rights of uh, gay people, right? But doing working on the disease surveillance, we want to capacitate the government to make their own DHS2 systems, which in turn, like, where do you draw the... Oh, that's the... That's the... Uh, here's a... here, here, you can answer. Here, tell us. <laughs> DHIS2 should directly support the use of biometrics. As Mike pointed out, we've been kicking the can down the road for a long time. DHIS2, is, biometrics is being plugged into DHIS2 in, in many countries. There are third, but these are all through third party extensions of DHIS2, not direct core support. Our developers working on it. So, should we get our core developers working on biometrics? And the questions are becoming a little bit more like pointed from here on out in specific situations. No, no. I think just um, on this question, I kind of wanted to maybe problematize it a little bit by going um, the, at least if DHS2 directly supports the use of biometrics, then DHS2 has some control about how the biometrics are implemented. I think that's just, as, as I read this question again, I'm kind of going, it's a slightly kind of a provocative thought about uh, ab about this particular question, because I kind of see there's a lot of uh, totally disagree generally to biometrics, but there's also yeah. kind of an, in an, in an inevitability to um, to biometrics becoming part of it so is it something that dhs2 should directly no. support and thereby having some degree of control agency over how it's used or nor yeah normalize right now we're allowing the wild west to happen yeah and if we if we took a if we if we more directly engaged like most things that we do we more normalize it potentially just a process question this microphone's about to die so i'm going to take that one for yeah. you because you should I can use this all right Let's move on. So this one you have to be fairly close okay. to. Yeah, let's be intimate. DHIS2 should be able to conduct workforce surveillance, monitoring how users use the system. Maybe just to flesh out a little bit more about what's being requested. What's being requested is a deep dive into how long they're in the system, what they click on, what they enter, no. which ones they're using. I mean, they want to have very granular details about the use of DHS2. No. Uh, many, many different donors, governments, NGOs. Is, this request has been coming as long as I've worked with DHS2. And some people have made apps. There have been apps presented uh, here at the conference that provide this. Because you can scrape the logs, right? You can see on the server everything that's happening. And you can pull that data out, but we don't have core support for it. But do remember one of those missions of data use and trying to drive people to actually use the system. So wanting to have some metrics about what's working, what isn't, mm -hmm. right? So there's there's different uh, there's definitely a case to be made for it. Yes, auditing is there. Um, everything is already tagged to a user if you want to go through the effort of pulling it out and looking at it. Yeah. All right. Oh, sorry. Do you hear back from countries? I mean, I know from the education side, if you if teachers know that they're being tracked, yeah. uh, not only they'll be, they'll be furious, but also they will just stop using the app. Yeah. And I was wondering if you heard about such cases in some countries. There's two there's there's two kind of polarized cases. The first one is that exact thing. And that's usually more for your professionalized staff. So like your like health workers at clinics and that kind of stuff. And they're like, I don't like having this extra burden on me. Right. The other one is uh falls in more in line with what's called the what's called the Hawthorne effect. Whereas if I know I'm being monitored, I'm going to do my job better. Right. And that typically has been a factor, at least in the in the research that I've looked into for like community health workers or like outreach workers, volunteer workers who have a relatively small job um, and feel and, and having that added pressure actually makes their performance improve. 
No, there's, I, there's, I can point you to some research. There's some, there's, there has been some, like. But as long as there's a benefit for the user, because yeah. um, otherwise, I mean, the, the extra task is always easier when you can really see something, mm. either game time or whatever. Um, but teacher unions in general react very strongly when, yeah. not, not about doing like recording or whatever, but mostly about knowing that their performance will be tracked, you know, yeah. like very surveillance, surveillance style, right? I was just thinking yesterday we had an example from Togo about you know, um, no, it wasn't Togo. It was like the the smart smart field boxes, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, I'm sure that someone at the bank is thinking about you know giving a chip to every child, and so you can monitor them when they get into the school. But then I was just thinking about one child going to school with twenty SIM cards in their pockets, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so we are kind of losing the purpose of these these things. If hundred percent, yeah. Of variance of that yeah. It doesn't have to be theoretical. MasterCard is very interested in longitudinal health records, and they're working in Ethiopia with Global Fund funding. They're very interested in turning health patients into financial customers. Mm -hmm. Quite a number of donors supporting that initiative as well. Um, all right. Is it acceptable? And this is extremely context-dependent. Is it acceptable to capture an individual's religion in DHIS2? Yes. Can you throw some light on the context dependency? Well, there's certain health programs. I mean, certain clinical treatments are dependent upon what your religion you are. So, for example, if you're if you're some religions, you won't take blood transfusions. It's important to know that if the patient comes into the hospital. There's also, I mean, specific areas of a country or vulnerable populations which are a majority of a specific religion, and become it becomes they even have health targets. They want to reach this certain mm -hmm. number of individuals within this vulnerable population, and it becomes a de facto religious registry. There are also plenty of examples of where religion has been used as the primary means of persecution or primary cause. Yeah, and uh, what I would say is that a major instrument, which is national census, uses religion. Yeah. You cannot do a national census without using religion because you have some interventions that have to be directed in certain ways when you want to reach this kind of population. So, yeah. for example, uh, even uh, this uh, um, demographic, health, demographic health surveys are use, do, done using, even if we are using, for example, surveillance, a disease surveillance, we use sometimes religion because we want to target some people in certain ways. So, uh, once again, the, you, you've given the response, this is context dependent. Yeah this on on civil registration in general because of course like if you get if, if everyone wants to collect data everyone will find something like a new variable to collect but i mean you cannot just collect everything on everyone and it's like just ethically morally and also like statistically um so yeah and, and for this specific question i would refer just to the civil registration in the country and if they collect it on the, their regular paperwork then it can be collected here yeah but there have been there have been folks who have told us we should just hard code it so that religion can't be captured. Okay, thank you for this concern. I think uh, in Asian region, I'm from Nepal, and so there is this different uh, religions, and uh, they have own culture and rituals. And uh, when we, uh, in, we when we want to do the any interventions, and then sometimes we should focus the religions. So I think uh, it's for betterment and for their benefits benefits then we have to uh, capture the individual's uh, religions in DHS2. Yeah, there's plenty of reasons to have it. Yeah, I think this, this is an interesting question and there's a lot of different kind of discussion going on in the room about it. Um, so it's one that, one that kind of interests me, how, whether, whether you should, kind of capture identity data, specific demographic identity data or whatever. Um like there's that there's that tension, isn't there, where like some of you are saying we need to capture this stuff because we need to be able to able to track what's going on with the population. At the same time there's a potential persecution. 
Um, so you've got this this core tension between human beings needing to be visible within a data set and the potential that if they if they're visible, then they they could be exposed to problems, they could be exposed to persecution, they could be exposed to all sorts of um unintentional or potentially intentional harm. At the same time, if they're not included, and if if there's a decision made to not collect um, individual uh, religion within DHIS2 or within 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 data sets, those people and their their religious um, the the uh, the impact that religion has their religion has on them is completely rendered invisible. Like this this, this rendering um, human beings invisible from a data set. Uh, on the one hand, it it has advantages because it it safeguards them, it makes it makes them less exposed to persecution for those identities. But equally, it also makes it impossible to monitor the inequities that those communities experience. So if there's like, um, if you don't track that that a person is um, is a member of a particular religious group, then you can't track how membership to that religious group. Uh, affects that community. It's impossible to track this stuff if you can't monitor it. And I, I would jump out just with a, a concept that may apply to other slides just as we're going forward. So in all of the kind of privacy and security legislation, GDPR, HIPAA, others, data minimization is a goal, right? And so I'll, I'll out myself as one of the somewhat disagrees here just saying, I think it's overused. I don't think enough thought goes into it. And again, back to the topic of having the conversation is important. I think by default, a lot of times they just throw it in there, not that they even have a specific goal or analytic attached to it. They just register somebody with that. And maybe some more thought should go into that. But that's true of a lot of things because data minimization should be the goal. Let's, uh, this one's going to be fun. Okay. U UIO should not work with militaries. Dang, I already outed myself on this one. Yeah, you did. We can include the U.S. Department of Defense as, as that as well. We just clarify, uh, should not work with militaries. Totally agree that they should not work with militaries. Yeah, totally agree that they should not work with militaries. Totally disagree, meaning that we should work with militaries. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's a little bit, uh, or that we can. And again, some ministries of health in some countries are the military. The, the, military. the largest health provider in the U.S. is the U.S. military. Yeah. Maybe also notice that it's UIO. Oh, yeah, sorry, I should say his center. That was a little sloppy with my. No, but still, his center UIO. We're so, not talking about any user of DHS2 or any his. His center UIO. <laughs> I mean, we have had people in military uniforms giving presentations, plenaries at this conference before, you know? All right. This is a fun one. The donor money is all gone. And it honestly, it's getting harder to get, right? You're all probably feeling that. Rank from the most to the least acceptable to receive money from. We've got to get money to keep the lights on from someone. So should we get money from pharmaceuticals, militaries, oil companies, credit card companies, Mike mentioned the MasterCard thing earlier, or Facebook social media? All of which have projects potentially using DHIS2, but they're not giving us any money. So you've got to rank. Don't think about think about your own ranking first and before you uh, come up here. So you're ranking from uh, most acceptable, acceptable to least acceptable. I think you just, what do you just drag it? Yeah.
Yeah, this is fun. Go Facebook. <laughs> you got it, Mark. <laughs> I think if you ask me to do this again tomorrow, there's no way I would have the same ranking. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a uh... tough one. But I mean, we, we have to be serious. We have to start finding alternative. We probably need to start finding alternative revenue streams for DHI's two core development. We don't, the, the donor money is shift constantly shifting sands. It's on, it's, 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 it's becoming increasingly less reliable as you're probably also experiencing if you're implementing uh, in your country or context, or if you're a donor, please give us more money. But um, we've got to figure out how to keep the lights on. We've got to figure out how to keep our developers employed. So we're going to have to start figuring out new revenue streams. Probably. Yeah. No, 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 no. From, no. Your, from your own perspective about it, but. So the, the example here is that there is an oil company that because I'm streaming online, I will not say the name of, but they use DHIS2 to monitor their oil wells. So they, they're just using DHIS2, just like you would monitor a, a water borehole or a school or a health or a health facility. You can use DHIS2 just as well to monitor oil extraction, crude oil extraction from, from, from wells. And if there was an issue in terms of if you're monitoring um, crude oil extraction, there's there, it to what is it related to good or bad? What is an example? Well, so there's not necessarily an inherent issue. Well, I mean, some people would say there is an inherent issue in oil generally, crude and our dependency. But the thing is, they're free riding, right? We're building DHIS2. We're building all the functionality to help primarily low and middle income countries in health programs, education programs. And here you have one of the wealthiest companies on earth using a free software and contributing nothing back to it. So that's that's one ethical side of it. Then the other side of it is about, should we receive money from them? Well, on the one hand, then they're not a free rider. On the other hand, does that impact what we develop? Are we mm -hmm. going to end up building things that are more useful for these oil companies, which is not the core mission of DHS2, for example? We could certainly optimize DHS2 for mineral, mineral extraction, but... At what cost? And Norway is an oil country, and we get a lot of funding from Norway. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, this is this is the. Uh... Might be interesting here is to, to kind of ask yourself what, how, what, what, what you went through in your head to kind of rank these things, because um, the uh, just uh, the 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 lady in the, in the red jumper there, you're. Your question kind of um it gets to the heart of like how how are we ranking these things in our head what what is it about um or like everyone individually what is it about maybe pharmaceutical companies that meant that you, you put it in a particular place or what is it is it about militaries that you put it in a particular place um maybe if you just take a take a little moment to kind of ask yourself what um what what made you decide to rank things in that way like are you are you saying that it's the perceived values of of the of the organization is it is it the potential for harm potential kind of um potential for unintentional harm from them um or intentional harm potentially from from them what is it yourself that that led you to kind of ranking in that way I think uh, we rank, for me, I rank them uh, in this way, uh, not in this way, in my way, <laughs> based on uh, if I accept money from any entity, I give it a credit. And this is uh, it's, uh, very important. They can use it. 
I, I just to just to compliment what you're saying, I think for me, I'm ranking it ranking it based on the region I come from. So to me, uh, maybe an oil company, to me, I see it as an income earner in the sense that, you know, the extraction, that's where we earn our income from in my country and it helps the region and so. But then I'm trying to also think of it because the HRS and sorts use around the world, I'm trying to tell myself, do I answer it? Not from my perspective in my country and my region, but because it's going to be filtered throughout the world, would it be um, good? Well, it, I may say oil company, I see nothing wrong with it. It may be something that's ha harmful out there. So is it more harmful out there in the world and least harmful for me? So that's the challenge I'm having, trying to look at it from my region's perspective. Um, thinking that's also, it's an international um, delivered service. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, we've, we've been asked before, can we make the DHIS2 dashboards possible to put advertisements on it, right? Because in certain countries, the DHIS2 deployment is reaching tens of thousands of health workers. And so if you want to advertise for your lab or your pharmaceuticals or something like that, putting it on the dashboard is a great place to do it. And you also fund the servers, right? So that money goes back and they keeps the servers running and that kind of stuff. I, I know we're just about out of time. I yeah, just want we are. to look at the comments. Are there any questions that popped up that we should try to address? Uh, for the yeah, thanks for flagging that. I don't see any. Uh, no. Is there another? I can't remember. No, this was actually it. Was yeah. So the hard part of the day is over. So... Get wrapping up thoughts well i i was just going to say is it, for us this is an ongoing conversation it's not over with this session um our intentions are to be reviewing what you guys responded but also initiating this more in the community of practice uh we do have some questions that we're trying to answer as the strategic group about an external ethics review board ethical frameworks so this will be information that we'll be using going forward, and hopefully you'll get some more transparency from us on, on the topic of ethics. Um, if I can throw in a, a final little thought. Um, I kind of want to ask you in in this room, I mean, we've, we've raised some difficult kind of problems, uh, difficult sort of di ethical dilemmas, uh, tensions within what's gone on. Like, how do you feel about, um, about, thinking and talking about these things is are you are, do you feel comfortable having been through the session does has some of it made you feel uncomfortable like how have how have you been feeling as uh as the session has been going on yeah thank you i think for me uh making the ranking make me uncomfortable because I, for me there is no difference between uh, the pharmaceutical uh, companies the military the oil company the impact on the environment the impact on the social economic and situation it's depend the ethics on the use of the tools we will do the source of the fund is not the most important thing the most important thing is how you use uh, this fund and the impact of the utilization of this fund in the population, in the environment, and the consequences, that is the most important. If you keep the ethics high to avoid any complicity with uh, like uh, the pharmaceutical company and the military company, I think it's, it's good. It's the help uh, the DHS to, to grow up. Because usually the military have the one who get the last uh, important science uh, development. If, if you say you will not collaborate with them, you don't want to collaborate with Facebook, you see, and then you will be back. It's a kind of, uh, you have to balance uh, to find the, the, the good uh, way to the, the good level of uh, ethics and then be there. to to rank 
that is a way. It's, it's, it's difficult to say uh, the pharmaceutical uh, uh, company are most best than the oil companies. That's not. Uh, it depends. I think we're out of time. We, we are out of time. We should let people take the next session. Yeah. Thanks for your thoughts. Thank Be you. Back. Hopefully really you enjoyed appreciate it. it.